I'm Dr Gemma Sharp from the University of Bristol and in this lecture I will be discussing ways to distinguish correlation from causation by minimising the role of bias and confounding in observational studies. By the end of this lecture you will be able to explain confounding, bias and reverse causality, describe the limitations of observational epidemiological studies, describe ways to reduce bias and confounding in these types of studies, and interpret associations from an observational study considering the potential for confounding and bias. So let's begin by going back to the basics and considering what epidemiologists are trying to do and why. So epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of disease or other health related states or events in different populations. Or put more simply, it's the study of how often diseases occur in different groups of people and why. Epidemiological information is used to plan and evaluate strategies to prevent illness and also as a guide to the management of patients in whom illness has already developed. Often in epidemiology, we're interested in causality. So does a particular exposure or a characteristic causally affect the likelihood of a particular outcome? For example, does drinking alcohol cause coronary heart disease? Does exposure to maternal gestational diabetes whilst in utero cause higher childhood obesity? Identifying a causal relationship is useful because it teaches us more about the etiology of diseases and identifies potential targets for intervention to modify the chance of a disease or outcome developing. Identifying correlative relationships that are not causal is also useful because it allows us to avoid investing in interventions that are unlikely to work and the exposure that, um, that we were studying might still be a useful clinical predictor of the disease outcome. To study causality, epidemiologists use a variety of study designs that can be broadly grouped into randomised controlled trials, or RCTs, and observational studies. So in a randomised controlled trial, researchers take a group of people and then they randomly assign them to be exposed or unexposed to a particular intervention or treatment. They then follow them over time to see if they get the outcome or disease of interest and then they compare the outcome in the unexposed and the exposed groups. Because they randomly assigned people to the exposure groups, any difference in the outcome rate should be caused by the exposure rather than any other factor. The RCT is considered the gold standard study design in terms of causal inference, but sometimes it's, it's not feasible or ethical to conduct an RCT. For example, we can't practic practically randomise some women to get gestational diabetes and some to not get it. And if we know that a certain exposure or intervention is likely to be harmful, then it's unethical to randomise some people to receive it. Therefore, we can't always rely on RCTs and instead we must rely on observational studies. There are several different types of observational study and they have varying ability to help us infer causal relationships. So assuming that these studies listed here are designed and conducted as well as possible, they're listed in order of their ability to tell us about uh, causality. So top of the list is the longitudinal st uh, cohort study in which researchers study a group of people over time. Some people will be exposed to the exposure of interest and some won't. At the beginning, none will have the outcome of interest, but eventually some will develop it, whereas some won't. The outcome status is then compared in the exposed and the unexposed groups. In the, the case control study, uh, this involves finding um, a group of people who have the outcome of interest, these are our cases, and then finding another group of people who don't, our controls. Data is then obtained on the past exposure of interest in all participants, and the exposure status is then compared between the case and control groups. 
In a cross-sectional study, data on the exposure and outcome of interest are collected at a single point in time and the prevalence of the outcome is compared in the exposed and the unexposed individuals. And then finally, in an ecological study, we use data collected on average levels or prevalence of the exposure and outcome of interest in several populations. The study um, then explores whether populations that have a higher prevalence or average level of the exposure also have a higher prevalence or average level of the outcome. So the unit of um, analysis is a population. It's important to realise that the, re the relationships that we identify from observational studies are not necessarily causal. So in other words, correlation might not equal causation. Because the research haven't, researchers haven't act, actively changed any variables while keeping others constant, so they haven't experimented, it's difficult to know that any correlation between an exposure and an outcome reflects a true causal effect. The exposure and the outcome might be correlated for another reason. So, for example, um, confounding, reverse causation, or selection and reporting bias. The association might also be spurious and, ex and explained by chance, but that's not covered in this lecture. So let's consider an example. This newspaper report claims that scientists have shown that drinking a small amount of alcohol every day reduces the likelihood of developing heart disease. But is this really the case? This article is based on an observational cohort study that found that the rate of coronary heart disease was lower amongst people who drank a small amount of alcohol every day compared to two people who did not drink alcohol. So one explanation for this association is that it reflects a true causal effect. So um, that is that alcohol reduces the risk of getting coronary heart disease. So the implication here is that people could be advised to drink small amounts of alcohol every day to avoid developing CHD. However, another explanation is that the association is confounded. So perhaps people that drink a small amount of alcohol every day are different from, from non-drinkers in some other way. And it's that factor that has a causal effect on lowering their risk of CHD, not the alcohol. This other factor is known as a confounder. And in this example, confounding factors might include socioeconomic position or diet. Another potential explanation for the association between higher alcohol consumption and lower CHD is reverse causation. So having CHD might cause people to drink less alcohol. People with CHD might choose to give up drinking to improve their prognosis, or they might be in a hospital where drinking alcohol is not available. As can be seen by the diagram on the right, reverse causation is essentially confounding by prevalent disease in this case. Finally, the association might be explained by selection and reporting bias. In this case, there would be no true association in the population, but it would appear in this study due to bias. So, for example, reporting bias would be introduced if participants at risk of CHD underreported their drinking. So that would introduce measurement error. So that it appeared that people who, who developed CHD drank less than they actually did. Or well, selection bias, particularly loss to follow-up bias, would be introduced if drinking alcohol caused people to either die or drop out of the study before they were recorded as having CHD. In both cases, these biases are essentially caused by missing data. So when we consider the hierarchy of evidence, we can see that observational studies are generally below randomised control trials in terms of their ability to identify causal effects. However, there are ways to minimise bias and confounding in observational studies that can greatly improve their ability to infer causality. And the rest of this lecture 
focuses on ways that we can achieve this. Firstly, to minimise selection and reporting bias, we can select a random sample of participants for a study that is rep representative of the population we want to study. We can make sure that we're uh, collecting the best measures of our characteristics. So usually this means that they are objective and not open to reporting bias. And this applies to exposure and outcome variables as well as any confounding variables. There's often a trade-off between sample size and accuracy of measurements. So for example, accurate measurements of height and weight might be made by a, a trained researcher or a clinician, but then participants would have to attend a clinic to be measured, which would limit the sample size. Self-report height and, and weight might be less accurate, but easier to obtain for a larger sample. To reduce reverse causality, we'll want to conduct a prospective study because the temporal sequence of events is difficult to ascertain in cross-sectional studies and in some case control studies. However, reverse causality can still occur in prospective studies if there are individuals in the cohort with undiagnosed disease at baseline. This can be minimised by removing early years of follow-up when the undiagnosed prevalent cases are more likely to occur. We could also use a natural experiment approach, which I'll explain in more detail later on in this lecture, or an instrumental variable approach, such as Mendelian randomization. There are several strategies that can be used to minimise the effects of confounding, and these strategies can involve alterations to the study design, or they can be applied at the analysis stage. So, so firstly, we could select a population that shows little variation in the potential confounder. So for example, in a population of non-smokers, smoking should not be a confounder. Alternatively, we could match participants on key confounders. So matching exposed or unexposed or case or control participants on one or more potential confounders can help balance confounders between the groups, thereby removing the association between the confounder and the exposure or outcome of interest. For example, we could make sure that case and control groups in a case control study were equally balanced in terms of mean age and sex. A special case of a match design is a match sibling design which allows us to control for multiple known and unknown or measured and unmeasured confounding factors introduced by genetics and by the shared environment. A within-person comparison, so measuring an outcome before and after an exposure can do a similar thing. Another way to minimise confounding is to compare the association between our exposure and our outcome of interest with the association between our exposure or outcome and a negative control exposure or outcome. So the negative control could be an outcome that you don't think your exposure of interest will causally affect. So for example, if we were interested in whether HRT use caused breast cancer, we could compare the HRT breast cancer association to the association between HRT and being in a road traffic accident which we wouldn't expect to be affected by the use of HRT. If the HRT breast cancer association was larger than the HRT road traffic accident association, this would suggest that it wasn't just spurious and it might be causal. The negative control could also be an exposure that we don't think will have a causal effect on our outcome of interest. So for example, paternal alcohol consumption during pregnancy is unlikely to have a causal intrauterine effect on fetal growth. So the maternal alcohol-fetal uh, fetal growth association can be compared to the paternal alcohol-fetal growth association with a larger maternal than paternal effect providing evidence of causality. Another way to minimise confounding is to compare associations across different populations with different confounding structures. So for example, many 
uh, observational studies, mostly from high income countries, show that breastfeeding is associated with reduced childhood obesity. In high income countries, more educated women with a higher socioeconomic position are more likely to breastfeed. But in um, some low or middle in income countries, the opposite may be true. So uh, more educated and more affluent mothers are less likely to breastfeed. If the association of breastfeeding with offspring obesity is not explained by confounding by SEP, then the magnitude should be the same in both countries. One study um, actually compared the association between breastfeeding and childhood BMI using two cohort studies with different confounding structures. So in the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children, or OWSBAC, which is based in Bristol in the UK, breastfeeding was associated with lower childhood BMI. Whereas in the Palotta's birth cohort study from, from Brazil, uh, breastfeeding was associated with higher childhood BMI. In this case, it looks like the association was biased by confounding by SEP because a randomised control trial found that breastfeeding was associated with higher childhood BMI, but with very wide confidence intervals that crossed the null. And I'll discuss this uh, example in more detail later in the lecture. Another way to minimise confounding is to take advantage of what's known as a natural experiment. So natural experiments involve a cohort being exposed to an external event or intervention at a specific time point. Associations are then compared with a similar cohort who were not exposed. And the assumption is that the exposure is caused by a quasi-random assignment. So for example, the Dutch famine of 1944 to 45 introduced a natural experiment. The Netherlands was occupied by the, by the Nazis at the time, who in retaliation to allied efforts to hinder their military initiatives, blocked all food supplies to the west of the country. Because the Dutch population was typically well fed before and after the blockade, the circumstances of the famine created what can be regarded as a natural experiment in which exposure to famine is, is uh, assigned based on an individual's time and place of birth. Follow-up studies have shown that inv individuals who were exposed to famine in utero during early pregnancy have multiple different health problems compared to individuals exposed in the later stages of pregnancy. Use of um, instrumental variables is another approach that attempts to use randomised factors to, it to infer causality. The approach has its origins in econometrics, but it's increasingly being used in epidemiology, most notably through Mendelian randomization, which uses random assortment of inherited genetic variants to proxy for exposures in observational studies. Attempts to minimise the effects of confounding at the analysis stage um, include adjusting for measured confounders in multivariable statistical analyses and also stratifying analyses by levels of a confounding factor. However, this does not account for unmeasured or residual confounding. It's often difficult to measure or to even think of all the factors that would be associated with both an exposure and an outcome. And even if we do adjust for the most important f confounders, they, if they're measured with error or modelled incorrectly, then we won't be able to fully control for them in regression models. We can check the impact of confounding and therefore minimise the role it plays in shaping our interpretation of a study's results by conducting sensitivity analyses. Sensitivity analyses are statistical simulations that address questions such as to what extent might the observed association be due to bias? What would the magnitude of associations between a possible confounder and exposure and possible confounder and outcome have to be to nullify an observed of, of an an observed association and how robust 
is the observed association to adjustment for additional confounders. Whether we use sensitivity analyses to explore bias or confounding, we need some prior knowledge to enable us to decide what sensitivity analyses to carry out. The extent to which unmeasured confounders are likely to result in important residual confounding depends on things like the number of uh, unmeasured or poorly measured confounders, the likely magnitude of their effects on the exposure and outcome, the extent that they're correlated with the measured confounders and the extent to which they're correlated with each other. Despite our best attempts, confounding and other types of bias are still likely to influence the results from observational studies. Therefore, it's useful to use several methods to minimise their effects and to compare results. And this is known as triangulation. In triangulation, we compare results from different studies examining the same question, but using different study designs, populations, methods, etc. And crucially, we expect the biases in all of these different approaches to be different and unrelated. So if results are consistent, we will be more confident about the causal estimate. Different study designs and analysis approaches have different and unrelated key assumptions and violation of these assumptions will have different and unrelated biasing influences on effect estimates. For example, multivariable regression assumes that all confounders are observed and modelled correctly. Negative control studies assume that there's no plausible causal relationship between the negative control and the exposure or outcome of interest. Within sibling matched comparisons, assume that all observed and unobserved confounders are matched and that there's no or little individual confounding. Cross-context comparisons assume that confounding structures differ between contexts and that this also extends to unobserved confounders. Mendelian randomization makes several assumptions, including that there's no pathway linking the genetic instrument to the outcome that doesn't go via the exposure of interest, and that there's no confounding factors, uh, that the confounding factors don't influence the genetic instrument. Even RCTs have assumptions, and the main one is that the randomization was successful and valid. So let's consider an example of triangulation of evidence from the literature. We'll come back to the question of whether having been breastfed has a causal effect on childhood BMI. So our first line of evidence comes from multivariable, multivariable regression. So a systematic review and meta-analysis of uh, prospective cohort studies of largely European participants found an inverse association between breastfeeding and BMI in childhood. Next, the cross-context study I discussed earlier found an inverse association of breastfeeding and BMI in a UK cohort, but no strong evidence in five, five cohorts from low to middle income countries. Next, a negative control study in Ausbach showed that having been breastfed was uh, inversely associated with obesity at age seven, but also with the same magnitude with parental report of the home having been invaded by pigeons and a positive association with even stronger magnitude with the home having been invaded by mice. Next, two within SIBSHIP comparisons gave results that were imprecise due to low sample sizes, but um, a multivariable regression analysis in unrelated individuals suggested that any association between breastfeeding and BMI was explained by shared familial confounding. And finally, a randomised control trial found that in over 17 thousand Belarusian women randomised to um, a, a breastfeeding promotion intervention or their usual care, the intervention increased breastfeeding rates 
and duration, but had no effect on childhood BMI or fat mass. Therefore, by triangulating evidence from all these different study designs, we can infer that the multivariable regression analyses conducted in high income countries were probably giving biased estimates and that actually it's more likely that there's no meaningful causal association between having been breastfed and later BMI. So to summarise this lecture, well-conducted RCTs are the best individual study design for studying causality, but they're often not feasible for some questions. Observational studies are therefore necessary, but they can be limited in their ability to tell us about causal effects due to issues with confounding, reverse causation and other types of bias. However, there are several approaches, both in terms of study design and statistical analysis, that can help to minimise the extent to which associations in observational studies might be explained by confounding or bias. Knowing and understanding the assumptions and therefore the limitations of observational studies and methods to minimise confounding and bias is important to correctly interpret findings. And triangulating evidence garnered from different approaches can increase confidence that observational associations represent true causal effects.